Politics and Prose, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. And we have a really a very informative program uh, for you this afternoon. Uh, for those of you not familiar with how this virtual format works, you'll still be able to ask a question of the authors if you'd like. To do so, just click on the uh, Q&A icon at the bottom of your screens. The chat function also will be active. And in that column, you'll find a link for purchasing a copy of this afternoon's featured book, Trump on Trial by Mary Jordan and Kevin Sullivan. Now, as, uh, as many of you uh, no doubt know, Mary and Kevin are married. Uh, they have been for 27 years. And it's been one of the most professionally productive pairings <laughs> in journalism, uh, and especially at the Washington Post. Mary was the first to arrive at the Post, joining the paper in 1984 after earning a master's in journalism. Kevin came seven years later, following stints at papers in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. The two were married a couple of years after that, and two years later were on their way to Tokyo to serve as co-bureau co chiefs. It was the first of three distinguished foreign tour tours they would share, uh, the other two being in Mexico City and London. They also shared a Pulitzer Prize in 2003 for international reporting uh, for an investigation of the Mexican justice system. Uh, over the rest of their time with the Post, Kevin has done some editing as deputy foreign editor and Sunday and features editor, and Mary's been covering American politics. And along the way, they've authored two other fine books together. And earlier this year, Mary came out with her own revealing book about Melania Trump, The Art of Her Deal. In Trump on Trial, uh, Mary and Kevin recount the impeachment and acquittal of Donald Trump. Uh, the book is based on lots of additional research and provides revealing new details uh, besides being a lively and engaging read. Uh, it was truly a, a group effort uh, with much of the reporting and research for the book involving more than 50 Washington Post journalists, all coordinated by a veteran Post editor, Steve Luxenberg, who's prominently credited along with Mary and Kevin. The result is a compelling narrative account, not only of what happened, but how and why. And al although we uh, all know how the story ended, the book as a review in the Washington Post said, pushes us to consider the efficacy of the impeachment process and the integrity of its outcome. So Mary and Kevin, welcome. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Brad. Well, this, is a, this is a real treat uh, for me uh, because of course, uh, we're all former colleagues going back to my own days at the Post. And uh, it's great to, to see of you see the two of you still turning out books together. And still married. <laughs> still married. Well, uh, it, it, maybe we'll, towards the end of, uh, of our uh, back and forth, we'll, uh, I'd like to ask you a little bit about how that process continues <laughs> to be so, uh, so productive. Uh, but let's, uh, let's jump into the, uh, into the substance of, of the book to start with. Um, I, I want to ask why we should even even care at this point about about Trump's impeachment. I know you know presidential impeachments are, are rare. Uh, Trump was only the third in U.S. history, or the fourth if you count if you count Nixon, who would have been impeached uh, but quit first. Uh, but but we know we know the outcome, and there was never much doubt about the Senate, you know, uh, refusing to f to find Trump guilty. The, the whole episode seems to have seems to have faded from view in the wake of the pandemic and other developments since. So. So, so what's the, the value of ex examining everything again? You know, just as you were saying that everything fades from view, it's been breakneck speed. It's 24 seven, it's one scandal after another. You can't even remember the outrage of yesterday. People are exhausted. Uh, and so the beauty here is that we use the written testimony, the oaths, the, the records, you know, there was an actual trial, there was discovery, and we took what happened, the actions of the president that led to only the third impeachment in US history to talk about how this president operates. And chief among them were, he disregards experts, he embraces conspiracy theories, and he's got a talent for seeding fake stories in the media. And the book lays out, in laying out impeachment and those three things, we kind of see in amazing concrete detail, the patterns. It's basically Donald Trump's playbook and it is relevant today. You're gonna to see tonight in the debate, 
some of the same things. It'll be uh, in large part impeachment was all about Trump identifying Joe Biden as his rival and trying to damage him. And this all happened so fast. Remember, I mean, this was like standing under a waterfall with a spoon getting trying to trying to absorb all this information that was coming at you so quickly during the impeachment. And we thought to kind of slow it down, put it all in one place and really lay out in, in great detail with powerful characters and colorful scenes, how Donald Trump operates, how, you know, this is, this is about the impeachment, but the real story here is you learn about how Trump operates and it's incredibly relevant to the election. You don't have to look any farther than today's headlines. I mean, you have the story in the Washington Post today talking about how Trump is considering firing FBI director Christopher Wray and possibly Attorney General Barr um, after the election. Why? Because they won't announce investigations into the Bidens. This is, this is central. This is a central theme from Trump on trial and from the impeachment. Yeah, Trump is nothing if, if not consistent. Uh, there there, there are, 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 of course, some other themes from the impeachment story that are echoing uh, today very much in the campaign. One of them is the whole issue of the role that Joe Biden and his son Hunter Played or didn't play in the in the Ukraine saga. Um, these are these are very much front and center in in the closing days of the of the current presidential campaign. Uh, Trump and his supporters have called the Biden family criminal. What what, what did your reporting for the book? Uh, well, look at I mean, just this. start with Joe Biden. Um, you know, Joe Biden was the vice president. President Obama gave him the Ukraine portfolio and said. We need to get we need to do something. This is a strategic ally of ours. There's a lot of corruption there. We need to kind of clean it up. So Biden was over there and he was working his his charm, trying to get them to clean up their act. And he was working. Remember, he was working in concert with the EU, with all of our allies, with the World Bank, with the IMF. Everything that they were doing there was a team effort to try to coax Ukraine in the right direction. There was a prosecutor there who everyone agreed uh, was part of the problem. So Biden and, and everyone announced publicly, this was publicly stated US policy, that they wanted this guy gone. And Biden went over there and he gave a speech in the Ukrainian parliament about the rot of corruption. And then he got the president aside and he said, listen, we have a million dollars worth of loan guarantees coming up for you people, very uh, coming up very soon. And we are gonna hold that up if you don't get rid of this guy. You have to, you have to show good faith here. And they did get rid of him, um, and but now that has been that's something that's been used against him during this during this period during the impeachment, to say that he's corrupt because, you know, he's he he pressured this guy, he pressured the government to get rid of this guy who was investigating, you know, his son. There's the reporting in our book shows that there's absolutely zero evidence for that, none. Both Republicans and Democrats, under oath, said that there was no evidence of corruption on Joe Biden's part, period. Um, uh, also, uh, you know, Rudy Giuliani is a key character in impeachment as he has been in the last few days. Uh, and again, you know, we should not be surprised at these conspiracy theories at, that we hear because it's been going on a long time. It was in fact, and Rudy Giuliani is in many, many pages of this book about how he, a former prosecutor, said to Donald Trump, his friend, basically, you know what? I know you don't like that U.S. intelligence said that Russia interfered in the 2016 election and it helped you. So then he went to try to confuse the issue and said Ukraine did and they interfered to help Hillary Clinton. And you know, it is the same kind of thing that that you know seed fake stories and watch them grow. And we have an amazing detail about how talented this president is at that. And you know, Giuliani was running around Ukraine trying to act like he was Perry Mason. You know, he was he was he was Trump's attorney, and he was trying to find the actual bad guy. He was trying to undercut the whole Mueller investigation that was going on, the whole notion that Russia interfered to help Trump. That was his his goal was to undermine that. So he picked up a page from Vladimir Putin's playbook. Putin in 2017 said, wait, it wasn't us, it was Ukraine. They were the ones who interfered in your election. So Giuliani picked that up and kind of spun it and spun it and spun it until he, you know, he had the ear of the president and pretty soon it was coming out of the president's mouth. Well, he doesn't appear to have stopped either. I mean, this whole latest uh, turn with 
Hunter Biden and Hunter Biden's laptop. What do you, what do you make of that? Do you think there's- It's the exact same thing. And, and that's why um, it was important to lay out what happened here because you'll see the seeds of this. I mean, Giuliani, incredibly, I mean, he was the former mayor of New York, friend of Donald Trump, uh, was going over the Ukraine looking for dirt on Hunter Biden um, and, and going on TV and saying outrageous things, things that our experts in the State Department said, what is this? And yet, um, even when intelligence experts, not one, not two, but many, many warned Trump what Giuliani was doing, he backed him up. Now, who benefits from Hunter Biden and Joe Biden getting smeared by Giuliani? Donald Trump. And like with so many of these things, of course, there's a little bit of smoke there, right? I mean, Hunter Biden was on the board of, of Burisma, a Ukrainian gas company. And he, surely he was on the board because his name was Hunter Biden. If he was Hunter Smith, he wouldn't have been on the board. But this is what this is what companies all over the world do all the time. They try, they want to put prominent people on their boards, makes them seem bigger than they are, makes them seem important. But there's, there's where it falls apart though is that there's no evidence and there's no evidence on that laptop that's provable. There's no evidence, there's, there's just no hard evidence anywhere that Hunter Biden did anything to, to affect US policy or that his father allowed him to. This was a political issue. It wasn't a legal issue. He, he hadn't done anything wrong. Or that, Don, or that Joe Biden actually you know, did something uh, because of his son. There's no evidence of that. Now, yeah, now, you know, maybe there'll be some bombshell between now and, and, and the election or something, but for the reporting that we did for months and months and months, looking at this, this whole situation, including to this situation with the laptop, there's nothing that you can point to that, 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 that proves or even strongly suggests that Joe Biden did anything wrong. Uh, you also spend a fair amount of time in the book writing about Trump's obsession with the, the deep state. Uh, what, what role did the deep state play in impeachment and, and how, how is that relevant to the- I mean, just go to the State Department and talk about morale. Um, you know, many, many people have exited, left great careers before they wanted to because uh, Donald Trump doesn't believe experts. He calls them unelected bureaucrats. Uh, and, you know, I mean, time and time again, you will see people, in many cases, people who knew Russia uh, and Ukraine, 40 years experience. And he would say, what do they know? Uh, and it was just so antagonistic that I think one of the wounds in the country right now is that people, the best and the brightest, are not going into government service that there is a, a feeling that you know that you're if you're too well read it's somehow elitist and you know and we and this isn't this isn't some theoretical problem this is a real problem and you see it right now happening still with the with the with the pandemic i mean didn't the, i think the president called tony fauci an idiot yesterday or the day before um, you know he's one of the most respected public health doctors on, on the planet um, and you may disagree with his, 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 you know, his political prescriptions, but I mean, Dr. Fauci as a scientist is pretty much unimpeachable. Yeah. Um, and, you know, this is, this is, this Trump's disdain for expertise, his disdain for competence um, is, is, is a real problem. It's hurting us in this, in the pandemic right now today. Well, I'm sure, you know, having reported overseas as long as you did, I mean, we used to hear the term deep state uh, applied in these authoritarian regimes and, and it's only under Trump that it's begun to be uh, uh, applied so frequently right here in the, in, in the United States to, uh, to our own government. And we're talking about, you know, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, somebody who was an immigrant and served in the military and in the White House, you know, just trashed for their service. Or people like Fiona Hill, uh, who, who were experts in their field, just the idea that there is no respect for people who were the constant, they were whether it was a Republican administration or a Democrat, back to Republican, they were there decade after decade. And you know, all of a sudden they're just called the deep state, and he's listening to people like his son Don Jr. or Rudy Giuliani. Well, we also in your own additional reporting about Colonel Vindeman and Fiona Hill. Did you find? anything that would call into question their own motivations? 
No, it doesn't exist. I mean, these people, you know, these people are, they, all of them, many of, all of them have served, served under presidents of both parties. They're bipartisan. Their oath is to the constitution. They are just solid citizens. They may have, the president might disagree with their interpretation of the phone call with the Ukrainian president. I mean, fair enough, but you can't really impugn their motives. Their motives were they saw something that they thought was, was terrible and they stood up and said something about it. And the Fiona Hills of the world and the Alex Vindemans and especially Ambassador Yovanovitch, Marie Yovanovitch, who was the ambassador to Ukraine. You know, she got up and testified in Congress. And I think many of us remember that moment when she was testifying and the president tweeted out, uh, you know, un completely undermined her. She was looking, you know, what a mess she's made in all the countries she's been and what good did she ever do? This is a woman with 33 years experience in the State Department and, and who knew that region. She'd been shot at and blown up and, you know, every other thing for her country. She had literally laid her life on the line for th three decades. And the president is, you know, tweeting at her and Don Jr. is saying something like, uh, you know, we need fewer of these jokers as ambassadors. It's just, it's, it's, it's not, it's not the way this country should behave. Yeah. Let me ask you about conservative media because they factored significantly during the impeachment. And um, how, how did Trump use his allies in right wing media to, to shape uh, his own narrative? Exceedingly well. <laughs> um, you know, there's going to be a lot of rethinking. Uh, some of the democratic institutions and how our society works after this election. I th we know that there's all kinds of things going on right now about why is it uh, that we are where we are. And social media is at the top of the list. Um, and that is why we spend a lot of time explaining how you can go on a station that has uh, almost no followers, right? There's, there's a, a network that just came up four years ago. Trump had a friend there, seeded a story. So they has a video. And then with this little known place, he starts tweeting it to his tens of thousands of followers. It boomerangs to Sean Hannity, who gets a whole new millions of audiences. And all of a sudden it's back around this echo chamber and people are talking about it. And it's all because of a genius talent for seeding information. And Trump was known to stand there and say, okay, I'm gonna to try to damage this person or try this nasty nickname about somebody, you know, whether it's Sleepy Joe or Nervous Nancy. Let's see how many seconds it takes to get on Fox. And so we really kind of X-ray how that worked. And it's more than just hot air. I mean, it has actual policy implications because in the case that Mary was talking about, so the Hill TV puts up this video of a, of a sort of disgraced Ukrainian prosecutor calling Marie Ivanovich corrupt. Absolutely zero evidence for this. Um, a few hours later, it's on Sean Hannity's radio show with 14 million viewers, listeners a week. And he starts repeating the same thing. Again, no evidence. And then he throws in Joe Biden on top of it. Again, no evidence. But the thing is getting bigger and bigger. Hannity has it on his TV show that night. Trump tweets, Trump Jr. tweets. And the next morning, 24, less than 24 hours after the original video went up, Trump tells John Bolton to go fire Marie Ivanovich. So, you know, these, it's, it's just a remarkable cycle. Yeah. Um, you know, there are a number of new details that, that come out in your book, and 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 some of them deal with um, they relate to the uh, this phone call that was at the core of the whole um, impeachment charge uh, phone call between Trump and and President uh, the Ukrainian President uh, Zelensky, uh, and 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 you know you you uncovered stuff about the uh, about what was going on in the Ukraine side uh, about the mood there in the Ukrainian capital when this was all taking place. Talk a little bit about that. This one was, this one was really interesting. We, 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 we talked to two people who were in the room with President Zelensky during the phone call. And they were very nervous because they needed some deliverables out of this call. They, they wanted more than anything, an agreement from Trump that he would meet Zelensky in the White House as a signal to Putin. You know, Ukraine is a very important ally of ours and Russia and Putin, uh, Russia and Ukraine are having a you know, kind of a war in the eastern part of Ukraine. And, and 
Zelensky wanted to stand at the White House and shake Trump's hand to show Putin that the alliance was strong. So they needed something out of this. So they were very nervous. They wanted something to happen. And the, all the aides were telling us, they were telling him, they were telling Zelensky, appeal to Trump's ego. Tell him, use the phrase, the swamp. He'll really like that. Just talk about draining the swamp. Trump will like that. Someone even, someone even suggested, maybe even suggest building a, a Trump tower in Kiev. And they said, no, that's probably a bit too far. But, um, you know, but the, they were so disappointed when it was when the phone call was over because Trump immediately started talking about Joe Biden and these other crazy conspiracies. And they're like, what was that all about? And that's the core of abuse of power that the House voted. I mean, that is basically the reason that Donald Trump will go down in history as the only the third president ever to be impeached. He's actually the only one who's been impeached who then had faced re-election because usually it happened in the second term or they left. So this, the, but the core of it is that phone call. So Trump gets on the phone call. Think of the power of the president of the United States. The Ukrainian president needs this military aid because Russia is breathing down their neck and, they, and have, killing people. I mean, they are at war. He needs this aid. Congress agrees, appropriates the aid. And Trump is on the phone with others in the Situation Room, including Vindman, listening to him say, well, you know, we really would, it'd be nice if you could um, announce that you're investigating the Bidens. Because, I mean, that was essentially it. It was leverage if you want the aid. And there were lots of back and forth and conversations with Giuliani. But, but the essential message was if you want the aid, you should announce publicly you're investigating the Bidens because that would damage him. I mean, he was seeding a smear campaign and that was Congress, the House voted abuse of power. And during the impeachment, the, 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 the Republicans were trying to say, look, you know, Trump, whatever Trump said about, about Biden on this phone call, whatever he asked of Zelensky, Joe Biden did worse. Joe Biden, you know, wanted that one got his got this guy fired in Ukraine. And they were trying to call it the same thing. But Joe Biden kind of shouted it from the from the mountaintops, along with the EU and the IMF and the World Bank and everybody else. It was policy. Trump, what Trump did was on a phone call that he never in a million years thought would become public. And he was going after a domestic political enemy. It had it had nothing to do with with US uh, foreign policy. Yeah. Um with regard to the, the CIA whistleblower then that kind of started the thing, you know, for, uh, to, to become public um, or at least make Congress aware of what was going on, uh, you were able to sort of recreate uh, step by step all the sort of agonizing deliberations this analyst uh, went through. I thought that was really fascinating. Uh, can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, that, yes, that was that was that was pretty amazing what that guy went through. Um, and, you know, he obviously he heard about what happened um, on this phone call. He was an expert in in Russia and Ukraine. He had the security clearances necessary to, to know this information. And he was a little bit freaked out because what he heard sounded to him like it was even a potential violation of the law by the president. I mean, he was really he really thought he was was hearing something terrible. So he he went and he went and saw it wasn't obvious though, though, to him first, where, where to go, who to report to. Right? Exactly. So he went to, a, he, he asked around about a lawyer who might have had experience in whistleblower law and he found someone, talked to him briefly and that lawyer um, referred him to another lawyer. And then that <laughs> lawyer said, actually, no, not me either. You need to go to a third lawyer. And he went to, when he went to, when he arrived at the third lawyer, that was the person who ended up representing him. But how did he end up talking to someone on Schiff's staff? Okay, well, this is this is where you get into a lot of problems. That was the first lawyer he went to because he knew this guy. They worked in the same basic, you know, field, and this guy did work for the for the intelligence committee. And he went to him and said, in kind of general terms, "I have an issue. I have something I need to blow the blow the whistle about, and it's in the intelligence world." And this guy said. Yeah, I, I think I've heard enough. Uh, you should go. I can't help you. You should go to you should go to a lawyer who can can, can handle this, not me. There's no indication that that shit, he, it, there's, no, there's zero evidence that the whistleblower spoke to Adam Schiff. 
personally never did that. And we have no reason to believe that this, this lawyer brought it up with Schiff. Um, maybe he did, maybe he didn't, who, who knows, but there's no, there's no proof. And we detail, you know, I don't think most people know that three stories below the U.S. Capitol, there is this kind of secure place where Adam Schiff and intelligence officials, the committees meet, and they're there all the time. Um, and anything sensitive is supposed to be viewed down there in the skiff, as they call it. Um, and this this played uh, big time in the impeachment. And we talk about how uh, the Republicans, uh, you know, stormed it one day, brought their cell phones in, and you're not supposed to bring your cell phones in. And they were trying to shift the momentum as more and more evidence was mounting that that Trump, uh, you know, would be impeached. And there was a meeting in the White House and, and the famous phrase that, that the Republicans heard Trump say was take off the gloves. Mm -hmm. uh, and so these kinds of scenes about these places where Schiff's people are meeting and looking at documents and talking to the whistleblower, um, you know, I think it, at the core of it, it's just an examination of power and about how people use it in the Capitol and abuse it. Yeah. And we should also say that this is this is not a one-sided book. We talked to as many as Republicans as we did Democrats and the Republican side of this is laid out in great detail in the book. And that's something you mentioned, Steve Luxemburg at the top of the broadcast. And you know, Steve was the editor on this. He's a veteran of the Washington Post. He understands fairness and he, he was he was there making sure that this thing was fair every step of the way. And uh, he's just we were just lucky to have such a great collaborator on the book. But, um, you know, it made the, the book is a fair representation of what happened there. It talks to all sides. And, and many people, when they finish reading it, um, they come to the conclusion that maybe Nancy Pelosi should not have gone for impeachment, that well, maybe me, that they should have just waited till November 3rd. And let, let, let me decide. ask you about Nancy Pelosi, because, you know, we're not going to have time to touch on all the key characters uh, involved in in this story, but she, of course, is, uh, is is one of the most most central. And you have this great sort of, you know, split screen type opening uh, in, in the book set back in March 2019, when on the one hand, the seeds of impeachment were, were being sown overseas in, in Ukraine. Uh, and on the other hand, Pelosi was uh, putting out word um, to a Washington Post reporter, as it turned out, that she was um, explicitly telling us Post reporter that um, you know she just wasn't going to back impeachment because she said you know he meaning Trump he's just not worth it. Um, so so what what did you discover about how Pelosi finally changed her mind? What what were her her calculations in the end? At the beginning, as you say, she wanted no part of this. I mean she had a risk calculation to do. She had to weigh the risk of doing something over the, the risk of doing nothing. And at the beginning, she decided that the, the safer course uh, politically and every other way was to do nothing because it, she didn't see anything that rose to the level of, of an impeachable offense. Now, there were already noises from the far left of her party saying, oh, yes, there are, there are plenty. Uh, and there was this pressure on her, but it started out as sort of a little squeaky noise to her left. It didn't really bother her very much. But as the summer wore on, it was getting louder and louder. And when the Ukraine call happened, um, when that transcript came out, she looked at that and said, the, the, the calculation changed. Suddenly the risk of doing nothing vastly outweighed the risk of doing something. And you know, it was a it, it very, very tricky, delicate balance for her, but, but that's where she got. I mean, do you think she now regrets her, her decision to go ahead with impeachment? Oh, I don't think so. I, I think she felt that he, this president, she would say, was ignoring subpoenas, uh, ignoring all convention, breaking the laws. If we didn't have some kind of a censure, some kind of a penalty for what the House said was abuse of power, what else would he do? Ironically, maybe the, maybe the strongest backup she got on that point was from Mitt Romney who stood up in the Senate and said, you know, a lot of people, are, a lot of people say we should wait for, for the voters to have to decide this, wait for the 2020 voters. That's not what the framers had in mind. When they, when they, when, when the, when the constitution was written, they included impeachment so that if we members of Congress 
saw some offense that was egregious and violated the constitution, we had a responsibility, not just an opportunity, but a responsibility to act. So I think, you know, whether you, whether we agree with it or not, I think Pelosi's rationale was he crossed the line and we can't ignore it. I'd like to ask you about impeachment and the, and the rise of the pandemic, because you know, the impeachment effort, or certainly the, the Senate trial part took place at a time when COVID-19 was just beginning to spread it in China and then around the world. In fact, COVID-19 gets a kind of a, a sneak preview in the book as a, as a sort of emerging new worry. Uh, and you note that uh, Trump's lack of focus on the threat. So to talk, talk for a moment about whether you think it distracted our nation's attention and particularly the attention of Trump and Congress and federal authorities from, from the rising pandemic. Um, you know, there is, for instance, the scene that you describe when Alex Azar, the HHS secretary, uh, is connects to Trump by phone, who um, and Trump is at, at Mar-a-Lago, and that's in January of this year. And you write that Azar had trouble focusing Trump's full attention on the deadly virus that was spreading in in Asia. Well, we know that um, Donald Trump. It's very hard to focus him. Period. Um, he darts. I mean, I've interviewed him, everybody, you know, anybody who sat there and interviewed with him, he's doing four things at once. He's talking about golf one second um, and, you, you know, like the health budget another second. So, and we also know that he was furious about the impeachment. Um, you know, image is so important to him. And the night he was impeached, he flew to Michigan and we outlined this incredible scene where he vowed that night to get reelected four more years, screaming to this huge rally. It emboldened him. And so impeachment did take up a lot because it was Trump knew he was going to go down in history uh, as being impeached. And he swore then that he will come back and win another term and be the only one to have ever done that. And so in that sense, did it take his eye off the ball? Um, you know, I think we'll, we will see, but we also know that he was informed constantly about this problem. And we, we know that there were many meetings on the Hill about it um, and they couldn't get his attention, at least publicly to do something. Right. And, you know, we, we, there was a little narrative that sort of started along, you know, back in February, March, that was sort of saying, if it hadn't been for this silly impeachment thing, we would have been much more focused on the pandemic and a lot of lives would have been saved. And I think that's a little, that's, that's going a little bit far. I mean, this is a sort of a walk and chew gum situation. I mean, members of Congress were getting briefings on the, on the virus at the same time that they were conducting the impeachment. They handled that fine. Uh, the president was also getting, getting briefings on this and he should have been able as well to focus on both of those things. He has a tough job. Yeah. Uh I have just a couple more questions to ask, and then we're going to go to audience questions. So for all of you watching, if you haven't yet put your question in the Q&A column, please do so. I'll say again, the Q&A column, not the chat column. Um, I'll, uh, we'll, we'll get to those in a moment. Uh, the, the book raises some larger questions about the impeachment process that are, um, these larger questions are left sort of unanswered. They're just meant to kind of for us to all think about questions about what the whole political ordeal says, for instance, about the health of our democracy and the separation of powers. Um, so, uh, so, so what, what, what do you think? I mean, when all is said and done, did the impeachment of Trump represent an, an ex exceptional event in American history, or is it some kind of symptom of a of our democracy being somehow in in, in decline? Well, one thing that it does raise is, does impeachment work in a hyper-partisan era? I mean, what are the chances of somebody being removed by the Senate when you need 67 votes? I mean, virtually no one thought that the Senate was gonna remove him. I mean, you know, people were just wondering if we could pick off, as the Democrats said, one or two Republicans. And because of that, I think, many people are saying, well, what check do we have on expanding uh, White House power? If the president um, abuses the power, what is the check? 
because it's not impeachment anymore, really. I mean, if impeachment means removing from office, that is almost not likely to happen if we are this partisan. Yeah, impeachment has really, I mean, after we've seen it three in three trials now, um, Johnson, Clinton, and now Trump. And it, it simply isn't the tool that the framers thought it was. Um, it's, it's, it's a protest howl. It's a way for the House to register its disapproval of the president. Um, and the question is, has that undermined the balance of power? Because this was, that was the most powerful check on the presidency that the framers gave to the, to the legislative branch in impeachment, this incredible power. And we see now that it doesn't, it doesn't work except as a, as a way to register disapproval. And you know, what's, what's the long-term implication of that? Will every president who faces you know, a, a hostile House majority now be impeached? Will every president who has a friendly Senate, a Senate majority on their side, will they just ignore this whole thing and just know in, in the comfort of knowing they'll never be they'll never be removed and they can spin impeachment as just a partisan witch hunt? Mm -hmm. So, what have we lost? I, I feel like you know the, the reporting in the book kind of shows that we've lost some along the way. We've lost this this empower this powerful way of separating the the branches of our government. Mm -hmm. Well, if there is a new administration. Um, and that bipartisan commission has set up some sort to look at the, at the courts. Maybe they can also look at this whole question of, of impeachment. Um, uh, all right, so let's get personal for a moment. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, this is the third book that the two of you have written together. And of course you work together overseas as, as a co-bureau chiefs uh, for uh, something like, like a decade and a half. Um, how, how do you go, go about reporting and writing together and, and, and and well, how, how's, the, how's the marriage holding up? <laughs> I think it's doing fine, but I don't know. You'd, you'd have to check with Mary. Yeah. You know, people ask us this all the time, and I tell them, and it's true, that when we've been writing together for so long, we've written, you know, hundreds and thousands of articles for the Washington Post together, and we've written three books, and, you know, I helped a little bit on the, on the Melania book, too. So we, we do these things together, and when I have to write by myself, I feel like I'm typing with one hand on the keyboard. I feel like I feel like half of my everything is just missing. So, um, it, it. I think the secret is that it's very hard and lonely to write by yourself, and in our case, uh, it just works, uh, and it's kind of one plus one equals seven. Uh, and I know that Six I've had, and one. I've had so, uh, so many people say, oh my God, I would never, I would kill my husband if I worked with him. He would drive me crazy. How do you do it? And all I can say is it's, he makes me laugh and it's fun. It is, it is fun. And I think <laughs> the other real secret is that we're not competitive with each other. Um, we've known other journalistic couples who try to try to do this and it doesn't work because, you know, uh, we view each other's success as our own. Mary has a good story or a good something happened. I feel like it's it's a win for me too. And there are other people who don't don't necessarily feel that way. So um, if you, but you have to not need credit for everything. You have to be able to. to well, you, you must have though have each have your own strengths. I mean, what would each of you say is the other's main strength? In this Mary's world? is thinking and mine is typing. Oh please, <laughs> please. I stand you up for that one. Uh, I'm I. I love reporting. I love reporting. I, there's the, Kevin is telling me stop. You've got we've got to sit there and write. <laughs> I get on a I, back when we had planes. Remember planes? Uh, yeah, I would yeah. I would get on a plane, and my nightmare was that the person next to me would start talking to me. And Mary will go on a plane, and the person next to her ends up at our house for dinner. That night. <laughs> uh, she just she 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 can she has this ability to talk to people. Well, so, I just love it. Yeah. So. And it, so that, that, that complements, I think. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, sounds like a great partnership. All right, let's get to the audience questions. Um, I, I'll, I really haven't had a, had a look at these, so let's just dive in. Okay, in retrospect, was it a mistake to draft impeachment charges based solely on Ukraine and obstruction of Congress? Should the House have included the obstruction charges outlined in the Mueller report or dug deeper into Trump's finances? Well, it depends on whether you're asking that question when they were having to make that decision or now, when, in hindsight. When they were having to make that decision, the, the, you know, the Jerry Nadlers and some of the other people on the left of the, the party 
were saying it's foolish to just do the Ukraine. Let's throw the whole kitchen sink at him. Let's throw every, he's done so many things in their view that we could, we could, you know, we could have, I think they were talking about a half a dozen or more articles of impeachment. And the centrists led by Pelosi um, were saying, no, I don't think so. I think we need to make this clean and understandable. It's gotta be something that clearly rises to the level of impeachable offense. And it's gotta be something that is easily understandable by everybody. Like, you know, everybody knew that the stuff Bill Clinton was getting up to wasn't necessarily good, right? I mean, every, everybody, everybody could understand that. So did they, did they wanna go on the emoluments clause and try to, try to you know, impeach Trump over something, a word that people don't even understand? But this is a question that will be much debated, but uh, you know, it's, it's kind of unanswerable now, but I think many people say that perhaps it was underestimated you know, the drive to get something understandable, it is still complicated. Yeah. This, this whole thing was more complicated than, and I think right now, if you ask people, what was it about? It'd be hard pressed to know. And I think that was a, a strategic error on their part. They, they thought that the, the stuff that would have happened in Ukraine with the phone call and everything else would be easily understood by, by most people in America. And, and uh, you know, it just wasn't the case. Well, as a follow-on to that, here's a question from, from Merrily Schwartz, who's another legend. <laughs> a brilliant question by definition, then. Uh, well, I mean, did, did any Democrats express to you second thoughts about um, not, uh, uh, impeaching Trump only on this and not on, on yes, on yes, other charges? Yeah, yes, and and you know, remember that the, there's a lot of different Democrats, right? There, there's the the people on the left, then there's the centrists, and there, there, you know, Nancy Pelosi has a pretty motley crew, and a lot of them, and they all have different opinions, um, and it, and it's, I think, one of the most amazing things that she was trying to do was to herd this whole crowd and keep them in the same direction, and it, and it wasn't easy. And again, it's the question of when are you, when should we consider this question? When they were making that decision, it seemed like, you know, I think people were pretty much on board with it, generally speaking. They got they all fell in line behind Pelosi on this. But you know, later you can it's it's a really easy question to ask. Maybe if we had had more articles, maybe if we had gone after him for for other things, we would have had a better chance. I don't I still don't think anybody believes that he would have been removed by the by Mitch McConnell's Senate, but it's a reasonable question about whether they could they should have gone for more articles. Uh, did any Republicans, especially Rand Paul, uh, who made significant hay about protecting whistleblowers? Did any, any Republicans express any reservations about revealing the whistleblower's identity? I, I should note that you're very careful. Although you write about the whistleblower, you don't name the whistleblower in, in your own book. Well, we're, we've, we followed Washington Post policy on that. And, our, and our, our policy was that there are laws protecting whistleblowers. You don't, you don't publish their names. You don't out a whistleblower. It's not. It's just. It's not. It's. It's. It's dodgy legally, ethically, and could be. It could be dangerous for the whistleblower themselves. So we didn't do that. But I think one interesting thing is that while impeachment is not in the ads, uh, the, tr the Biden Trump ads, right? It's. It's not front and center. You don't hear about it for this November 3rd election at the presidential level, but you certainly do hear about it in certain states. And I think the Senate took a beating on this. I think people like uh, separation of power. They like that Congress is seen as a check. And in this case, many of the senators are being taken to task for just falling in line with Trump. A lot of the opponents out there, you, you know, comes to mind the main election right now, um, that some, you'll, you could very well see some of the uh, Republican senators lose on November 3rd, in part because of all these ads and what people remember about their performance and what they did, mainly that they fell in line without kind of thinking through what constituents were saying about impeachment. And I'm from Maine, so I've watched that Sarah Gideon, Susan Collins race, uh, you know, fairly closely. And impeachment's very much a live issue there, or, or at least the way Susan Collins approached it. Because that you know she sort of has a reputation in Maine for trying to appear like she's a centrist, moderate, but then always siding with the president, always siding with Trump, and I think Sarah Gideon is trying to make the point that she's not a centrist, that she's actually she may talk a centrist game, but she's actually on the right. Um, 
and the, and her position on, on, in the impeachment is very much part of that discussion. Mm -hmm. Have you heard though any Republicans express regret for naming the whistleblower? No, <laughs> I don't think they feel any regret. I think they, yeah, I think you know, because Rand Paul particularly was out there, you know, saying 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 the name of the person who was the whistle we all believe was the whistleblower, uh, you know, out loud and trying to get the mainstream media to write about it. And people wouldn't largely for the reasons that I, I just said, but I, I don't think they have any regrets about it. I think, I think their feeling was that this guy had said things about the president that could cost the president his job, could get the president impeached, that they, that they strongly disagreed with, with his interpretation of, of what he was saying. And that they felt they had every right to to talk to this person, to call him as a witness, to depose him, to get his side of the story, to get him out, to make him answer for what he was saying. Now, whistleblower law says that you don't have to do that, and uh, and this guy followed the law pretty closely. Um, here's a question from Morton Cavalier: uh, Wasn't there a complete transcript of the call put in a secure server, uh, but the public only saw a summary of the call? Did you find out anything about the transcript that was put in the secure server? First of all, hi, Morty. I feel fine. Thank you very much. Morty was our doctor for, for a very <laughs> long time. So um, there was a, there was, they don't generally call it a transcript. We tend to call it a rough transcript or a partial transcript because um, after Watergate, they, for reasons that, who knows why, but they stopped taping things like this. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> so now they, they have people, they have stenographers, they have people listening to the call and taking notes. And then a, a, a rough transcript is made from those notes, but it's not verbatim. Sometimes you see ellipses in these things and it's either they couldn't, rem they couldn't really hear what was being said or it didn't make any sense or, you know, it, it's, it's hard to tell. So it isn't a verbatim transcript. There is no, it, nowhere on the planet exists a verbatim perfect transcript of that call. The one that we all saw is the best that, that is out there. So here's a question from someone who didn't give his or her name um, about Hunter Biden. Are, were you all um, able to determine how and why Hunter Biden was hired to sit on the board of Burisma? Uh, uh, does uh, Hunter Biden have expertise in the energy sector? Uh, I think shedding light on how and why he got on the board will help clarify that piece of this because no matter how you slice it, um, it, do, it still doesn't look great for the Biden family. And I, I think that people would agree uh, in the Biden camp that they wish he hadn't done that. Um, in 2014, he was hired there. Um, and you know, I, th I think that that will probably come up in the, in the debate tonight. Uh, and I, I guess the, the, the key question, you know, really is not about the son, it's about the man running for president, the father. And did he get him this job? There is no evidence of that. Did he do something um, to, um, because uh, for this Burisma group, did, did father, did Joe Biden do something? And there's no evidence of that. Uh, you know, Donald Trump has his own children. Uh, with some issues about how their father's job is, is enriching them. But yes, uh, you know, I, th I think that a lot of Biden people sure wish he hadn't picked that job. And also remember that when this happened back in 2014, uh, when he first joined the board, there were, there, were, there were lots of stories about it in the press. There were stories in the Washington Post and the New York Times. This was no secret. And a lot of those stories were very skeptical. They were saying, uh, Joe, Hunter Biden, who has no expertise in energy, is on the board of an energy company in Ukraine, and he's making tens of thousands of dollars a month for that. What's that about? I mean, it's long so, been a political problem. The appearance, right. the appearance is not good. But I think that the key question has been, uh, again, did Joe Biden do anything wrong? And it's been going on now for six years, people talking about this, and there was no evidence of that. Um, so, as you know, we were talking about previously, I mean, impeachment doesn't seem to be a very realistic kind of uh, ultimate break on presidential power, the way it's played out over the history of the United States. And so Mark Yost asks, uh, if Trump wins this November, uh, are there any limits on presidential power? And that's exactly why the Democrats said they felt they had 
to impeach him because they said, if we don't stop now, there'll be no limits. And I think that right there is the Democrats' biggest fear, especially, you know, if, uh, if the Senate is going to back them up. And it's, uh, there are no breaks anymore. There's, I mean, it's very, I suppose that, that Pelosi and the Democrats could, could work up their nerve to do this again and impeach him again if he did something else. But I think, you know, I think Trump, you, you can feel it. I mean, from, from the moment he was acquitted, he had that ceremony in the East Room of the White House where he was, was kind of crowing about the acquittal. And, you know, he had every right to do that. But just the way he the way he was talking that day, you could tell that he, you know, that man felt like he'd gotten away with it. And he, he maybe he felt like he'd done nothing wrong, but he thought that there was, there, I, I think he feels like there's nothing that can, can stop. Oh, him. he felt definitely wronged. He, he thought that this, um, but I, th I think to the answer to that question also depends not just on if Trump or Biden wins, but what happens to the Senate. Um, because it, it'll be a different game if both the Senate and the House are Democratic controlled, even if we have a Republican in the White House. Bill Fox asks, uh, are you surprised that uh, the impeachment has not played a bigger role in the Biden campaign against Trump? I, you know. <laughs> good question. It's, it's, a, it's a good question. I think, remember what's happened to this country since impeachment happened. I mean, you know, we're living through this unbelievable pandemic you know the the race the racial race relations issue in this country are just you know so difficult there's so much going on that that, that feels more urgent i think to people and i think these the political camps are are trying are, are are really focused on what they feel like is what people are thinking about talking about living through i mean rising unemployment a pandemic of the century you know wow the good old days were impeachment <laughs> You know, it's just been one epic, you know, issue to deal with after another. Well, in, 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 um, in doing your book, which, which characters did you come away feeling, you know, um, even, even better about, say, than when you went in? And which ones did you come away feeling more critical of? Well, there's, so uh, uh, Representative Alyssa Slotkin from Michigan, she's a freshman with a CIA background who uh, ran as a Democrat and barely won in a district that had gone for Trump in 2016 in the 2018 uh, midterm. And she was someone who was very leery. She and a lot of the other centrists were very, very leery of, of impeachment because they knew that in their districts that made them incredibly vulnerable. I mean, it was one thing to stand up and take a principle, stand up and disagree with Trump on, on some issue, but to be on record as voting to, to remove him from office, that's a pretty tough sell in a Trump district. So she was, her process was pretty remarkable here. She, she went, she was at a holiday event in December of 2019 at the National Archives and just kind of found herself walking among these kind of founding documents and just thinking like really feeling the weight of this and she went home to Michigan for the weekend and sat at her great grandfather's desk in the cabin and just, I mean, she just, she went through a real soul searching. And I thought it was a, a real credit to the system, to the, to the, to the quality of some of the people we have um, in office, because she really, she really thought about this and she announced her decision. And then she went immediately to a town hall where she got crucified. I mean, you know, she just got absolutely battered for her, for her announcement that she was going to support the impeachment. So I came away from it thinking, feeling very good about her. And there, there's all kinds of people, the comptroller at the Pentagon, uh, you, you felt good about people that are working um, in the government in difficult jobs about their backbone and how they were standing up saying, I don't wanna break a law here because this money has been appropriated to go to Ukraine. Um, you know, and, and then on the other hand, uh, we did hours and hours of interviews with people in the State Department. Um, and I don't think Pompeo uh, came out very well in this because they thought, uh, and many of these people were appointed by Republicans. Uh, these were top level people just said that they, they were just surprised uh, that the head of the State Department was not backing up his own people. There's a freshman Republican from Texas named Will Hurd, and he was another one who the Democrats thought they might be able to flip because he's a very centrist guy. Again, another one with, with CIA background. 
Um, and we wrote about his process and about how he decided this. And it was very difficult for him in, in Texas, you know, I mean, is again, difficult, difficult for him to take a stand against Trump. But he, he thought it through and he came out, the way that he finally came out was, what I see is bungled foreign policy. I see incompetence. I see, I see really stupid mistakes made by the president and the people around him on this. I just don't feel that it rises to the level of an impeachable offense. I think there needs to be a, a specific crime committed. Yeah. And I don't see a crime. I just see sort of incompetence. And he gave that speech and he stood by it. And, you know, again, I mean, there were a few Republicans who said that the vast majority said the president did nothing wrong, totally on the side of the angels, absolutely did nothing wrong. But her and a few other people stood up and said, no, this wasn't good, but I don't, I just don't in my conscience, in my heart, I don't feel like it rose to the level of impeachable offense. I think people would be surprised at some of the credentials of the young people going into Congress. There's a huge number uh, that served in the military, uh, in the intelligence services. Uh, and I think for all the bashing of Congress, that when you zone in and you spend time, and we did with key people, it's, it's pretty amazing the depth of their experience and what they're have done for the country. And it's it's so easy to say, oh, they're all just a bunch of idiots. And it's just not true. I mean, and, and how, how about John Bolton's part in all this? I mean, had he come forward when this was all going on with everything he knew, you think that would have made it any different? <laughs> um, I, you know, people continue to be furious um, because they say, why didn't you speak up when we really needed you to? Uh, was it because you were writing your book? Um, you know, I think he would answer and he has answered, you know, nothing was stopping this president. Um, so that's a question for history. He also, you know, it's, it's interesting um, in the interviews with him, he, he said that he would have been willing to be interviewed by the Senate, but not by the House, because the House had this two-tiered, this two-pronged system where they did a private deposition and then a public, a public hearing. And you know, on matters as, as complicated as this and as delicate as this, and as partisan as this, as hyperpartisan, there's always the chance that somebody's gonna say, wait, that's a little bit different. What you said in public is a little bit different from what you said you know, in your deposition. And it's kind of a gotcha game and he didn't wanna play that. So he said, if they call me to testify in the Senate, you know, one, one shot deal in public at a, at a, literally at a trial, I'm willing to do that. Uh, but. You know, they and, you know, people said, I wish he was thinking less about himself and more about the country. Um, let's end with this uh, question from, again, an anonymous attendee. Uh, it's so evident that this book needs to be read uh, and read widely. Uh, who do you hope it reaches the most? Well, first of all, that is a brilliant question. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, you know, we, we feel the same way. We feel like it's a good book. We feel it's important. We feel like it touches on relevant uh, topics. It's not yet another one of these, um, you know, gotcha Trump books. I mean, there's so many books that come out in there and, and they're just so angry and partisan. And, you know, we feel like this one is a real serious look. And we hope that people who are really interested in how government works, how politics works, um, will read this book. Um, and I think that's why we spent so much time in the, you'll see that just about every fact, every interview um, footnoted who we spoke to, you'll see that we, how many Republicans, how many Democrats, the actual documents and the sworn testimony. And that's why this matters because it really lays out the playbook for Donald Trump. He, he doesn't you know, change his tune. I mean, these are the same things he's been doing and we'll be hearing it tonight in the debate. We'll be hearing it in the last days of this campaign. It really shows you um, what's going on in Washington in, in a level of detail um, that made it worth all this effort. Yeah. And I really, this is, this is very important. This is not a dry history textbook filled with footnotes and, you know, I challenge you, I dare you to read this book and find it boring because <laughs> it is not. It, the characters, these characters are epic. Um, and the scenes that we're able to recreate are, are just fantastic, I think. And I, it really, you know, I, I, I know it's a little hard to believe that there's a page turning book about the impeachment, but I'm, I'm telling you, <laughs> here it is. This is, this is your chance. Well, that's, that's no hype, I'll second that. I mean, you know, <laughs> look, everybody watching thinks that probably they know the story 
And let me tell you, they, uh, uh, Mary and Kevin really do bring it back to life in a way that makes it much more interesting even than when we were watching it all, all those weeks uh, seemingly long ago. Um, thank you, uh, Mary and Kevin, for, for spending this time with us um, and for doing such an important book that adds, I think, to the historical record about this uh, critical moment in, in US history. Uh, to everyone watching, a uh, reminder that you can find a link in the chat column uh, to buy uh, Trump on trial. You know, you click uh, uh, on the chat button below. Uh, and and, and thank, thanks to all of you for, for, for tuning in. From us here at Politics and Pros, stay well, 